Welcome trial tappers. Who are trial tappers? I coined a term and feel they are people that have found hope, resilience, and post-traumatic growth after life's trials and traumas. Today, I'm honored to talk with Dr. Ruth Gerritsen McCain. I invited Ruth as my guest to share with us her story, how she became a trial tapper and to share her experience around post-traumatic growth after a trial or trauma. Now, Ruth had a tragic experience in her life when one night, we were working together and co-facilitating some family therapy groups inside of the prison when I'm sad to report that her husband, Brian, was hit by a drunk driver and died from his injuries. Her story is impactful, and I know you will learn from her experience. She is currently the director of the MSW uh, Field Education Associate Professor of Social Work at Regis College in uh, Massachusetts and an Emeritus Associate Professor at the University of uh, Utah and oversees the development of practicum of internships locally, nationally, and internationally for social work students. She trains field instructors in a role of mentoring uh, future social workers, and internationally she's engaged in research, distance learning, uh, in the community capacity. She's lived in uh, Buenos Aires for 18 months with her partner Brian, and during that time they were able to develop relationships with community members, social workers, and other agencies. And, and additionally, she conducted a dissertation in uh, the University of KNUST um, for the Department of Sociology and Social Work in Ghana. Now, the goal of this research was to develop a model for field education that could be utilized by the faculty at KNUST in their emerging BSW program. Further, she's conducted research at the Utah State Prison in regard to spirituality of incarcerated Native American men. Warmly included in the dialogue, Dr. McCain is also invited to participate in talking circles at the prison. And further, she was the director of the BSW Education and director of the Global Social Work and associate director of the BSW program at the College of Social Work at the University of Utah for many years. She's engaged in multiple global research projects that directly impact families. <laughs> Growing up in poverty in Salt Lake City, Dr. McCain felt the sting that can come from being viewed as less than. Her life was forever changed. As along her path, she was mentored and strengthened by social workers, teachers, and most importantly, her partner, Brian, who <laughs> promoted, prodded, and insisted that she return to school after a hiatus of 20 years to complete her undergraduate degree. She was, he was her strength as each day he fought to ensure she would see her worth. She's passionate about the well-being of families and their configurations in hopes of small, in a small way she contribute to her, their success. Ruth is an amazing example and has shown post-traumatic growth. I'm grateful for you, Ruth. Once again, thanks for being here. My pleasure. It's always such a joy to be with you, Hugh. We go back a long way. You were my mentor, one of my mentors and facilitators of my education back when I was dragging my feet and refusing to engage in educational process. So thank you for that. Well, it's always been a pleasure. We've known each other for more than 20 years. It's amazing to think of that. Yeah. Well, for those that are listening, you might be unfamiliar with the term of post-traumatic growth. Um, let me explain a little bit about that. So some researchers, Richard Tedeschi and Lawrence Calhoun, and they coined this term post-traumatic growth. They found that people were able to emotionally grow in one of five domains. The domains that they found were one was uh, they found people found more personal strength or the second domain was that they could relate well more to, you know, to others. Another domain they found a, a new creation, appreciation for life. Another domain they found was spiritual strength. And another was some new possibilities. Now, they found that people didn't need to have what they call growth in all of these areas, but at least one of these areas. So Ruth, I would like to ask you some questions along these lines to help you under help them understand your trial growth sure um, now i know you've had a lifetime of trials but 
I hope you'll start by giving the audience some background into your trial around the passing of Brian. Well, thank you. It's, you know, it'll be 18 years, December 28th, 2004. Hmm. And some days it's like it was yesterday. And other times it feels like, oh, that was almost 18 years ago. But but for the most part, um, it just feels very, very recent. And, and I think that speaks a lot to the fact that he was just such a positive factor in my life from the moment we met. Um, and so... Brian and I had the opportunity, as, as you indicated, to live in, in um, Argentina. We lived about two and a half hours northwest of Buenos Aires in a little town called Baradero, which was interesting because it was a city that was the first Swiss colony in Argentina. So we looked a lot like most of the people there. The further you got out from the little village area, the more indigenous folks were, which was our greatest joy was spending time with those, with those people. I will say that we were serving a mission for our faith while we were there, and I was working on my PhD at the same time. I had permission to do so, so <laughs> that was a good thing. During that time, and that, that's why what I'm about to share, I, I don't share lightly, and I, and I hope those, your, those in your audience can, you know, show tolerance and acceptance of the rest of this piece of the story, um, whether folks of faith or spirituality or whatever that looks like for your audience because I absolutely honor all of the ways we navigate what spirituality might look like and how we wrap our minds around such things. But a few months prior to us coming home, Brian had um, shared with me on a walk. We would walk on the river and for our exercise in the morning we were talking about various things and he said, well, let's say someday I'm in a terrible accident. Let's say I was to be hit by a drunk driver. Let's say, and he goes down all of these injuries, and he said, I don't want to stick around. I don't want to go through all the rehabilitation and all of that stuff, because he was very physically active. He was very athletic. He I mean, he never had a bad day and he always had an active day. So he was just like, I don't want to go through all that. Well, I was very disturbed by his comments because we had married later. We had brought our family together. Um, and so I felt like I waited a long time for him and I did not want to be a part of anything that might suggest an early exit. So I actually covered up my missionary badge and I said, what the elder, you know, <laughs> put in your own expletive there. And he just said, well, I, you just need to know that. Well, one evening I was working on a paper that was due that night on, for my class, my PhD class that I had permission to be doing. And he would go up to the balcony or the, the rooftop terrace of our apartment to say, offer his, his evening communications with our higher power. And he came down that night and he took a look at me and he said, you know, you're going to be around for a while. And I thought, well, I hope so. I've got to get this paper in tonight. It's due, you know. <laughs> and he smiled and he said, well, I won't be. He said, but you're almost done with your PhD. You will see the world. You are going to have such an impact. And Again, I was just so frustrated because I just did not want to hear such things. And I'll reflect a little bit more on that in a little while. But we came home the day before Thanksgiving um, of 2004. And approximately five weeks later, he was killed by a drunk driver. Um, he survived the initial accident and was life flighted to the University of Utah. They had to pause for a while because they did lose him once there. And worked very hard to get him back, got to the hospital, and the ambulance team came in and, and let us know that he was a fighter, he was working very hard, that, you know, he was not doing great, but, and then shortly after, the doctor came in and said that while preparing him for surgery, they lost him again and unfortunately could not get him back. So, in a nutshell, with lots of stuff left out in there, um, that was the nature of, of the accident and, and what happened. And, and honestly, Hugh, had we not had those earlier communications, 
because it I don't know that how I would be doing today, but it's, it's again, those pieces, those gifts along the way, however they're presented to us. And I think as we look for those gifts, they're actually there for us. Wow. That's amazing. I, I had not known that part of your story. So that's, I appreciate you sharing that with us. Sure. Yeah. What a, what a blessing to have that ahead of time, those discussions. Whew. Well, you know, it takes me back to in my books, I talk about this concept that no matter how painful this trial, that we're going to have to re- accept a new reality and to recover. Um, so one of my questions is like, how did your personal strength increase after this? Well, I think that's such an important question, because as you indicated prior to discussing Brian's situation, I, I did have a pretty traumatic childhood, you know, growing up. My my father spent a lot of time incarcerated. He spent a lot, you know, there were really some really tough things to get through, especially growing up in Salt Lake City, being considered white trash because of the poverty that that we experienced. And, and I will say one thing that laid a foundation for me was a um, a little Canadian mother who scared me to death most of the time, but always made it perfectly clear that regardless of what, what came our way, we could get through it. Well, that's, that's one piece of it. But I think more importantly was as I reflected upon, as I was going through the initial trauma of, of Brian's death, I also was reminded, if you will, from the universe, that throughout my life, the greatest gift that I have been given are my associations. Whether it was for a 30 second moment blip in time or years, the people that I had crossed paths with that just impacted me so, so much. Um, I found out I had a, a, a social worker as a child that I had to, we had to go in and prove that we were worthy to get benefits and when we walked into her office, there is a picture I had drawn on her office wall. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm important all of a sudden. So this crumpled little girl having to go prove she's worthy of food, all of a sudden was sitting up straight and tall because there's this picture. Now I realized later on that social worker probably had a tickler file and depending on which kid was coming in, she'd hurry up and throw up their picture. But that had such an impact on me that I didn't even realize until with this with Brian, as I started to reflect, who has crossed my path? Who can I lean to? Who can I um, be reminded of? Because that truly has been my greatest blessings. And honestly, Hugh, you were one of those people as well. You crossed my path. You taught me so much. You helped me through navigating. You welcomed me back into this opportunity to engage with you. You supervised me. You, You just were there. And one of my associations, because you keep in mind, he died December 28th. The, se- the school semester started a couple of weeks later, and I had to be back in school working on my finishing up my PhD, or at least the coursework. And I had not really broken down because you don't do that. You're tough. That must be from the English heritage, you know, stiff upper lip and all that good stuff. But I, one of my mentors in that moment, who's a dear friend today, we were talking about something in her office because I just wasn't sure I could even breathe in the next moment. And she said to me, and I will never forget, keep showing up. And I lost it. I, because I was so fearful if I started crying, I would never stop. And she just, she held me and she just said, keep showing up. That was so profound and so many times now has played through my mind through the years when I find something particularly challenging or having to face something that's associated with the loss of Brian is keep showing up because truly it's important for me to honor him. I want to honor him. Um, You know, as you can imagine, when we combined our families, we brought 12 children together total and there were emotions all over the place when something like, this happens and 
and I've I've been able to sit back and kind of see, you know, 18 years later, where some of those those children, they were all adults, today are still struggling because they have missed some of these important pieces about showing up, about okay, what brings us strength? What are the things that we engage in? Whether it's um, nature, whether it's a, getting out of our comfort zone, what does that look like? Whether it's being of service. And so I always reflect on Brian and the way he speaks to his every day was a gift and that appreciation of life. Every day was that. And so I try to keep that in mind. I, I often say when I'm when I'm feeling really warm and cozy in regards to Brian, I go to a house of worship close in my neighborhood. When I'm angry with him, I go to the cemetery. I spend a lot of time at the cemetery. But yeah. <laughs> and so but again it's just that that sense of how we are connected uh, in the here and now and beyond. You know, I, I tend to believe that that we are connected, um, however it's configured universally for eons, we we are connected. And and so again, that whole idea and that attitude around, for me, that existential, that spiritual strength comes from um, having had a pretty eclectic base in 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 such things and yet the work that i've done um around my profession and especially around folks uh as you know hugh around folks with with drug and alcohol issues and things of that nature that being able to bring in again something greater than ourselves and the strength that that can give when we can know that there's there's others looking out for us however that that might that might be and so you know i i just see these as the walk how we navigate um because it's okay to be weak it is okay to have really bad days it's okay to have all of that and so then what do we what do we do and how do we navigate through that and i have no doubt you and others i could drop a dime on in a second and say oh, i'm really in a bad space and the love and the friendship and and relationships that I've been so blessed with would help me navigate through that. Yeah, I, lo I love that. And I appreciate you sharing all that and how that connects so well with, you know, post-traumatic growth. And when I, when I hear that, you know, this, the spiritual connection is powerful for a lot of people. And even the people that I work with with counseling as they come in and for various trials, this is a struggle sometimes to, to try to navigate their faith and in what's happened and where where all this fits in. So there's sometimes there's a navigation to go closer towards and sometimes they pull away from it in this struggle. It's yeah. pretty interesting to watch. I, I think so. And and I think if we can normalize that we will navigate however we need to navigate. And that if we allow a navigation process to occur, um, there will be some interesting twists and turns that we can lean into even even more so. But to think it that we have to be perfect in this process, oh, no, 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 no. That, um, you know, wouldn't it be lovely to say that, you know, since the loss of my sweetheart, that things have just been hunky-dory. There have been no issues or problems ever since. That was my big boulder, if you will. And I often think about you, Hugh, and I think back to some of those early pictures you used to draw for me and like the boulder and how are we going to, you know, and, and you would show all these creative ways to get around the boulder. And and I have thought, yep, exactly, because there's been plenty of trials since. Will there ever be one as significant? Honestly, I pray not. I hope not, you know, but but certainly there have been some that have come fairly close, but but my hope is that, you know, that as we go and we for and not forget that we are a community, that as we as we try to overcome and come through and navigate around, again to pull in community, and have enough 
concern, if you will, for ourselves to really be able to figure out maybe what's what's a good relationship in those kinds of things and maybe even some that we have to let go of for a while if not longer even sometimes um some might it's kind of like the whole attitude around forgiveness right when we think about forgiveness and it's like well you've got to forgive and forget well i tend to think forgiveness is critical and i know my family uh, some of my family, those who knew me were not surprised, but forgiving the man who killed my husband was actually um, pretty easy. I, I never, I felt angry. I felt all of these other things, but forgiveness was, was a non-issue, if you will, because again, I was honoring my husband because he practiced and demonstrated forgiveness. Now, that does not mean I need to go have, you know, a soda with this gentleman necessarily. But I was one who at his parole hearing spoke and requested that he be released from prison. Because first of all, I was so surprised that he got the, the length of sentence that he did that I did not expect. I figured he'd be there for a year and that would be it. But it was actually uh, a minimum of five years and, and such. And so I joined with his family. In fact, they told me at the prison it's the first time they allowed the perpetrator and the, the, those who've been perpetrated against in the same room to talk at the hearing. Because I said, we're all on the same page here. We just need to get this done because I had a pretty busy schedule. And, and so it was important for me to say, you know, I'm here to honor my husband, which is, no, I want him to be able to, this man to be able to go home. And I'll never forget when he turned to my family and said, I took Brian's life. He saved mine. And, you know, and it, I mean, he had folks there wow. testifying on his behalf from the prison, like one of the wardens, one of the, you know, different people there that had talked about the amazing things he had done while he was incarcerated. And he made it very clear that the path he was headed on, you know, because like he said, this may have been the first time I was ever had a DUI, but there should have been many more before that. Wow. That maybe would have saved Brian. Well, a lot of people couldn't get to that point of forgiving and everyone's on a different journey, obviously, Absolutely. in that forgiveness path. But I, I don't want people to get the impression that you, I, I see a lot of this with especially, particularly women and some men that I've worked with who've gone through some pretty horrible abuse issues. And they have in their mind that they have to forgive and forget and actually stay in contact with or whatever and you know i think i think back to some of your writings you as well and that is not the case you can forgive and forget for yourself to be able to move on in strength and power but that does not mean you have to continue to engage because sometimes choosing not to engage after forgiveness is the kindest thing you can do for that person as well because seeing you every day is or being engaged is again that constant reminder of some of the things that they did you know there's different ways to think about it yeah and you know i always think of when i hear different people religious leaders or there's different people saying hey you sh you need to forgive like, eh, it's a, they're on their own path and journey you can't tell them what they need to do Absolutely. they already felt like they're a victim they don't need to like uh, maybe another victim by making them do something they don't want to do absolutely it's so it's so important you know i again that's why i i tend to look at forgiveness as a place to help me not the other person but me to be able to peel back or take off one of those boulders off my shoulder if you yeah want for sure yeah but, but i'm not stuck in the thought of them yeah i don't ever want to tell someone they have to forgive someone but if it helps you, I think many people feel freed when they do it, mm -hmm. but whenever but they can. Exactly. That is so critical because there's a time and place. Yeah. And to suggest that it has to be, this is the prescription and da, 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 no. You know, it, it's kind of like grief and the cycle of grief, right? 
when you think yeah. about that or, or different things and you're oh i'm in step three now oh wait i'm back in step one. Oh wait no i'm in five no i'm back in two yeah that's life that's that's just life yeah for sure and i think of that and people you know think you know the stages of grief or that it's linear and it's not it bounces all over the place and exactly and so yeah it's it's interesting well well that takes a lot of courage for you to do that i don't know how many people would do that in the audience but i'm glad you're sharing that story with people and i mean one of the things we talk about um in my book is that we shouldn't when you go through those trials, try not to limit, let those trials limit your potential for the future and your growth. And you talked a little bit about, you know, what Brian thought you would be doing mm -hmm. or could do in the future. And I know I outlined some of that at the beginning, but will you share with us a little bit of, you know, what new possibilities have opened up or yeah. helped you move forward in this journey? Well, you know, and as I suggested, I would I thank you for bringing it up again, because as he said to me, you know, you will, you're going to see the world, you're going to be out there in the world. And I had been to three countries at that point in time, Canada, USA, Mexico, I guess, if you count Argentina, then four countries, but I, you know, counted the USA. And who would have thought as I progressed, as I showed up, as I continued to show up, that I would be afforded opportunities that my dissertation for my PhD would be a global dis dissertation, that my research would be global in nature. I, I literally, just a couple of weeks ago, returned from Peru, and that was country number 57, you know, of, of the four, if we count the US, that when he said, you will see the world. And I could not even imagine it because I hated to fly to begin with, you know. And now I'm a, I was going to pull off my thing here. Now that I'm a million miler with Delta, you know. <laughs> but um, it's just having, you know, leaning in, being able to lean into the conversations, to the love, to the power, to, um, again, however we determine what that looks like for ourselves and what speaks to us. Um, we, if we lean in, even when we're afraid, if we can lean in, acknowledge our fear, own our fear, I'm a firm believer there are just incredible things that will come our way. What I had to do to have these things start to reveal themselves is, as my dear friend said, show up. And I had to get out of my way because the the tapes playing in my head, the fears of all of those things, all of the years that Brian had taught me my worth, you know, that I had faked for so long, all of a sudden I was back there, if you will, where, ah, I don't know about this, I'm, I'm, I'm not so great with this, that, or whatever. Um, but in spite of me and being able to let go of those things, opportunities arose to accomplish tasks and things that I hope, 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 hope can um, make a difference in some ways. I mean, I've been a, you know, a visiting professor in China and in South Korea and, in, you know, those kinds of things. But, and then the beauty of this is just, again, my life has been so impacted by every time I've met someone in the most, in most far reaching places the gifts they've given me by talking to me about their country or their political systems or their food or their clothing or their celebrations. I mean, oh my gosh, such incredible, incredible gifts. And my sweetheart, my, my partner in crime, Brian was very clear that these opportunities would prevent themselves. But again, I knew I had to get out of my way and I knew I had to show up. At least that's what was taught to me. Well, I believe in that spiritual connection and that's amazing. He was able to see that for you ahead of time. So you've done amazing things. Um, what would be some of those accomplishments that you're most proud of? Oh. I am most proud of the opportunities that I've had to and I, I, I should have brought some photos with me. I apologize. 
but when I've been able to be within my own community and particularly outside of my comfort zone in other global locations, when I've been able to play with children, I, I, have a, I have a photo of me on my hands and knees in the dirt playing a new little game like marbles, but you use pop tops, pop bottle tops to play these games, holding a child that is sad and crying and comforting a mother who now as a grandmother is holding her new, the newborn that her daughter gave birth to and died shortly after, you know, in, in uh, Mozambique watching that woman and going through her process and being able to share space. I'm just really proud and grateful for the opportunities that I've been given to share space with folks that I'm so humbled by and think, how on earth do they do it? I could never go through what they've gone through, you know? And yet again, they live the most simple, beautiful lives. And, you know, as, as I was watching these little guys one day running down in in Ghana, in Kumasi, Ghana, these little two little boys had long sticks and they had like the top of like a deodorant can or something and they put their sticks in there and they're racing back and forth, having such an incredible time laughing and having a wonderful time. These little guys playing soccer that use plastic bags that they rolled up to play soccer with. And I thought to myself, huh, I wonder if I gave those to my grandkids for Christmas, how they'd feel about those, you know. Um, but again, such a privilege, so blessed and such a privilege to be able to. Um, so they're not my accomplishments, if you will, but I've just been blessed to hold space in those moments. That's awesome. Well, I'm sure there's people listening, thinking their trial is like, they're in the middle of it. like how am I going to get through this? I can't see me going through this or anything like this or their particular trial. So what advice do you have for others that might be going through a really difficult trial or trauma right now? Give them, be patient with yourself. Allow yourself time, as we talked about earlier, to navigate, knowing that you know, there will be those glimpses of beauty and hope. And then they might come crashing down in the next moment with darkness and sadness. But as you lean in and strive to hold to those those pieces, I mean, just a quick story. I was, again, as you indicated, I was heading to prison that night to do some groups. And my last conversation with my husband was, it was December, he'd been golfing. It was a beautiful day, all the things he loves to do. And he had a garbage can and he's pulling weeds. And I'm like, stop doing that, stop. We're gonna need those garbage cans, don't do that. And I didn't even kiss him goodbye. You know, I was too busy being the boss. And he just smiled at me. And as I reflected on that shortly after, I, I just, wanted to be so sad and so upset that I would do that to him. But you know, knowing him, all I could do is laugh because the look he had on his face was kind of like, oh, Ruth, you got to love her, you know, because <laughs> he showed so much patience. And so rather than allowing myself to sink down to those depths of, I should have kissed him goodbye, I should have given him like the I should have, I should have, I should have, they serve no one because no one knows what's going to happen in the next moment and knowing how much he cared knowing how much he wanted my happiness again it was striving to honor him and when i strive to honor him um things become lighter for me because i'm reminded of just that sense of humor and that kindness and so if we're patient with ourselves if don't feel guilty for all of a sudden laughing about something, you know, embrace it, embrace it. And when you're, when you're crying and it, it's okay to embrace that as well, but just don't put a time limit on things. Things will naturally progress. You know, there's the old saying, well, time heals all wounds. I think that's a lie. I don't buy that for one minute. I just think in time, things are different. 
things are just different. Because again, I'm confident that when we're through here today, the rest of my day is going to be kind of like, <laughs> you know, I'm going to be kind of in that place of, oh my gosh, as I look over at our photo, you know, and I'm like, how could this be, you know, but, but time just makes things different and difference. Okay. Difference. Okay. Well, if you don't mind, I would like to show some pictures of you too. Oh, look how cute are we? This was our engagement photo, us old, old fogies there. So cute. All right. And then this photo was taken the day we on with deck i indicated we got home the day before thanksgiving and this was at a thanksgiving party the very next day so you know on december 18th he would be gone wow so um is there any before we, i would like to get into some other concepts that kind of lighten the mood in a moment but are there any last things you want to say about your story your journey here with spirituality or any of the post-traumatic growth areas oh goodness just finally being able to be in a space of gratitude if you will my children have always told me I'm the most optimistic pessimist they know. And my mother would always tell me I was the serious one. I couldn't laugh about things. I, well, hey, life was pretty darn serious and there was a lot of crazy stuff going on and everybody was laughing about it. And I was offended as a small child that they were not taking things seriously. But, but you know, yeah, I, I worry. I can be, tend to be pessimistic, but I'm optimistic about it. So, uh, Again, I'm, I'm just glad that my higher power loves me more than I can imagine. Well, I really appreciate you telling this story. Well, on a, on a lighter note, I have a few questions I like to ask um, just to get to know you on a different level. So what are your favorite hobbies? Oh my gosh. Well, playing phase 10 with the grandkids because I'm so darn good at it, even though I have a couple of grandkids that cheat, but I call them out because I'm not going to let them win just because they think they can. No, 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 no. Um, traveling, of course, when I'm given the opportunity to do that, I'm very grateful and, and feel very blessed to engage with folks and their cultures. Um, walking. Walking is a huge hobby of mine. And thank goodness it really helped when I was in Peru a couple of weeks ago at 13,000 feet. But um being with, being able to have um, my associations and and such, but I really do like my alone time, you know. And so, you know, I, I again, I'm pretty eclectic about hobbies, if you will. Okay. I try pretty much anything. Nice. All right. Well, what's on your nightstand, or what are your favorite books that you would recommend to people? Oh my gosh. Well, I actually have a, a book club. There's three of us in this book club. And on my nightstand right now has been, oh, what's his name? The chef. Hold on. Don't go anywhere, folks. I have to show you. It's right here. <laughs> uh, it's very, it's been very interesting. It's the Kitchen Confidential. Wow. That's what that we've currently been reading. I'll tell you what, I don't know that I wanted to know everything that's in that book. <laughs> but um, that and uh, my, my, I have uh, my scriptures, if you will, um, that I'm pulling out and trying to stay current. I'm trying to stay, but, but it is what it is. And pictures are on my nightstand. Alexa, I can't say that too loud because she'll start talking. It is on my nightstand too, so I'll whisper it because she'll just start chatting away if I say it too loud. <laughs> <laughs> Alexa, shh, quiet, stop. <laughs> oh, she's still going to keep talking, so I apologize. You're fine. All right, well, what's something uh, interesting about you that we don't know? Oh, golly, that's interesting about me that you don't know. I'm just so darn interesting. I don't know. Then that's what you don't know. No. Um, 
I've put over probably 50,000 miles on a motorcycle as, as a rider, not as a driver, maybe as a driver, maybe 30 miles, but <laughs> so I've, I've, I've done a, a lot of that and I love the holidays most particularly two most particularly Halloween just right up there with you know gotta have it and then the other one which I still have friends from all over the globe that reach out to me on Friday the 13th because I think Friday the 13th are a gift and a true holiday <laughs> and I'm glad that there's usually several of them so yeah that's that's <laughs> I haven't gotten a, a happy Friday the 13th wish from you, Hugh. I'd like you to correct that in the future. Okay. <laughs> nice. Well, Ruth, I do want to thank you for sharing your story. I mean, this is a great example of post-traumatic growth. Um, I mean, I plan to do other videos to try to help other people with other stories. And uh, I just really appreciate the time you took and the friendship that we've had over all these years and the example you've been to me and all that you've done to help me throughout my life and different trials that I've had. So I really appreciate that. My pleasure. And I look so forward to hearing more from from future podcasts from um, folks that you'll be interviewing because I just find, again, this this sort of format so helpful to me to continue on, on a positive path. Well, I hope, uh, I do hope we get to do many more of these with other people that have been through this. And, you know, I just want to remind everyone that, you know, post-traumatic growth is possible after trials and traumas. And I truly believe that. And I teach that to uh, many people that I do counseling with. And, you know, I always believe in that, that we can tap our pain and find this path and we can grow stronger after any of these trials that we go through. So again, thank you very much, Ruth. And, uh, We'll talk again soon. Okay, take care. Thanks. I hope you will apply these skills and become a trial tapper. Our motto is, we tap pain, we find a path, and we grow stronger. See you next time.